Hello, my scholars and saints. So I just decided to do a video. It is evening for me around 8.42. <clears throat> um, usually I'm doing my nightly routine, but I thought, oh, I don't feel quite like getting ready for bed yet. So it's a Tuesday for me. Happy almost summer vacation for those of you who are professors or students. It's almost summer vacation, so hopefully that means wonderful, blissful, sunny weather that's, you know, good outside weather, not too windy. Wind is my little demon right now, I think, but just because of where I live near the mountains. So today or tonight or whenever you're listening, I wanted to do a bit of a May book haul. I usually try to buy about five or six books every month just to kind of keep things interesting. I'm a serial reader, is that what it's called? Where I tend to read about five books simultaneously. And so there's always something I'm finishing and I might like something that's been on my shelf for a while or hasn't, it just depends. There's really not a strict rhyme or reason to the books that I choose. So as you'll see for this month, it's a bit of a mix of philosophers that I am just continuing to read, new writers that I've been inspired to pick up because of uh, different encounters, and then um, sometimes it's just a, a book cover and a familiar name of someone that I think that I should read. So first up, we have Nietzsche's The Birth of Tragedy. This was his first book that he wrote. And I'll, uh, since you know it's a book haul, that means that I haven't read the books. I'm going to read them. So I'll probably read the back covers of some of them at least. But I'll tell you a bit about the books as well. So this was published in 1872. It is considered a work of dramatic theory. And uh, it was reissued about 14 years, 12 or 13, 14 years later, uh, which is really interesting because Nietzsche has a bit of an introduction uh, called an attempt at self-criticism where which I think is incredibly self-reflective and it makes him just quite attractive as uh, an, a nice person to know which isn't always how he comes across in some of his works so Nietzsche is someone that I've read quite a bit of when I was entering into my first year of an independent study. Nietzsche, along with Camus and Freud and who else did I read? I can't remember, but he was one of the philosophers that I just wanted to read a lot of. Um, probably because I had picked up Thus Spoke Zarathustra and just kind of heard about it. And then when I started my independent study, so now I'm actually like a formal college student pursuing my second PhD, but that's a long ways off. But I'm basically a philosophy major in a university now. Um... But when I started my independent study, I was in a reading group. I think we were reading Beyond Good and Evil, so that was that was not necessarily the first Nietzsche book that I had ever read, but 
it was the one that I read um, completely through. I had started reading The Spoke Zarathustra when I was in Wexford, Ireland. I picked it up at um, kind of like a, it was just a local bookshop. It had some used books, it had some new books. And I just remember thinking Nietzsche was a grumpy cat. And yeah, I just I kind of put it aside. But I eventually finished it, and it is an amazing literary work. It's quite enjoyable, kind of inspired by um, the heroic journey of, uh, you know, the Christian figure of Jesus, but also kind of a romantic figure, this wise, enlightened person who is being indulgent in life and giving a cheerful, although like gritted teeth, cheer, <laughs> cheerful response to the suffering and pain of life, trying to evolve humanity, which only, um, you know, it's a mindset and attitude toward life that only a few will be able to attempt because Nietzsche really sees the masses as kind of weak and pathetic. So he's up on this hero, is up in this mountain, kind of like an ascetic monk. And after years of just kind of communing with nature and animals in his own sort of enjoyment of solitude and, and the self, he decides to descend the mountain and see what state humanity is in and maybe look for any signs of you know alignment with his own mindset. So that it's it's really a good time. And I've read the gay science, I've read on the genealogy of morals, which he wrote, I think it might have been his fifth book. And he basically wrote it, it's kind of a good summary of his previous books, because he wrote it in defense of those books. He felt like, as if his works were not getting the interest that they were due. I have read about 50% of The Dawn of Day. That's what my copy is called, but I think traditionally it's called Daybreak, um, which I really loved. I think I just got distracted. So I will probably pick this book up after I finish The Birth of Tragedy just because I'll be on a Nietzsche kick by the end. And then um, lastly, I've read... Uh, a book, How to Read Nietzsche. It's by Keith Ansel Pearson. I would really recommend it as commentary. It's a part of the Norton Simon Kreitley series. And I, I usually don't enjoy or I'm not at the point in my journey of philosophy where I enjoy commentary and secondary material, but this series is really typically really great because it gives you a good chunk of uh, the actual text um, or texts, works of a philosopher. So it gives you a variety, like kind of like a collected selection. And then it gives you a very short, um, well, not very short, but each chapter is only about six or seven pages um, commentary on like the paragraph they give you. So I'm really excited about this one. Basically, Nietzsche is arguing that the ancient Greeks who enjoyed and celebrated and found catharsis through their tragedy the the yeah the tragic form of drama that was basically the highest form of art due to um, and this is sort of the dichotomy that he creates in this book talking about both of Apollonian and Dionysian elements um, he says that 
life is always a struggle between these two elements, which represent basically order and disorder. And uh, they both kind of are in this dialectic as a natural check or balance. He felt that, so Nietzsche is always a person who, uh, he, I guess he evolved his ideas and approach toward nihilism, but I don't, I think probably when most people hear about Nietzsche, they feel that he is a nihilist, but he is not really, because he has argued even in this book that one should transcend the pessimism and nihilism, that pessimism and nihilism, a la like Schopenhauer, is a, a natural, realistic, valid response to the absurdity and the suffering and the pain of life. But Nietzsche would rather us be sort of courageously almost embracing of life um, so that we can rise to our own power. And so he felt that that's what the ancient Greeks did or classical Athenian tragedy as an art form did. It transcended this pessimism uh, of a fundamentally meaningless world. So he's not saying that it has meaning. So Nietzsche is, I guess, like proto-existentialist here because he's saying that because Nietzsche is definitely creating meaning. Um, or at least uh, a valuable stance toward the world that he would argue for. So the, so the Greeks, the ancient Greeks, by looking into the, this human suffering, they actually affirm it. They passionately and joyously affirm the meaning of their own existence, which they are creating. Nietzsche really thinks that the masses are petty and pathetic and weak. Uh, especially Christianity, because it basically rejects this world and puts faith and hope in a world to come. But he, you know, doesn't agree with the sort of Christian moralistic path. He wants to go beyond that, and he really wants to embrace the polarities of terror and ecstasy. So I think uh, I think this book is really, I actually started reading this one, and I really think that it's interesting how this came about. So uh, Nietzsche was actually delivering lectures about ancient Greek drama, and he gave those lectures to his friend Wagner and his wife. Wagner's wife was also, Cosima was also um, really close to Nietzsche. And both of them, Wagner and, and Cosima, suggested that Nietzsche write a book about the subject. And he did in, I think, like less than a year. So Nietzsche is an inspiration to us all. So I've also picked up, let me see, let me move my microphone here. I've also picked up what is going to be my second Roland Barth. So right now, I'm in the middle of reading A Lover's Discourse, which was published in 1977. This is not part of my, uh, part of my haul. Mythology is, is a part of my haul. So Lover's Discourse is a book that, I've, that I bought previously. And basically, I'm, I'm absolutely loving it. I'm loving it so much. I feel like it's, it's a sacred text that can only that is so valuable, it's only, only this, the warm sunshine, the summer sun is worthy of, of me reading this book, um, if that makes sense. Like, I need a specific, there's just something about the sun hitting your skin that just begs sort of a, a book that is as sensual as a lover's discourse. Basically, in that text, there are uh, fragments, basically fragments of reflections of a lover seeking to, it's an unrequited lover, seeking to in, encounter, be seen by, enjoy the 
and savor the experience of, you know, their beloved. And uh, basically, Barth was interested in the possibility or plagued by the impossibility or the improbability of uh, what he described as neutral writing. So he wanted to avoid words with loaded social context. He was kind of interested and obsessed with signs and how signs could, by their in, intended or manufactured signified, could manipulate humanity and society, etc., because of the messages that maintain the status quo or, you know, sort of, I guess, paved a way toward increasing commodification. So he really wanted to write, avoiding words with loaded social context. Of course, that how do you do that? But he created, or he wrote the lovers, a lover's discourse as a, as a novelistic form of rhetoric that he felt would not seek to impose its meaning on a reader, even though I think the whole text, some would argue, it challenges a reader's views of social constructs of love and uh, the unrequited lover is supposed to make evident these illusory myths, but I just find it very sympathetic and sensual. I'm, I'm agreeing with it and, and celebrating this, this unrequited lover. I think it's just wonderful. But anyway, so uh, mythologies is what I... Um, is what I picked up because I... Reading A Lover's Discourse, I knew I was going to absolutely love him. And uh, so I'll tell you a bit about Roland Barthes, basically a French philosopher, 1915 to 1980. It's really interesting how he died. I think he was hit by a laundry van in Paris um he didn't die instantly but um but that's just I don't know it just it seems so tragic and kind of random <laughs> um so basically he was interested in semiotics different science systems and he focused on western culture pop culture he was born in Normandy but very or somewhat early on in his childhood his adolescence his family moved to paris he had health issues um i forget what was wrong with him but he had uh, he struggled with his health pretty much his entire life uh he was i think he was even part of a medical study of some sort um so he received a degree that is basically for those of you in the States, like a master's in the early 40s from the University of Paris. And he actually, so here's a bit of a tie to the Nietzsche book I got. Um, he wrote his thesis on Greek tragedy. So in the 60s, he was really, that's when he um, got interested in, although his, uh, his basically like his bachelor's or his, pre-grad license was in grammar and philology so he was from the beginning I guess he was interested in language but in the 60s he really started to explore fields of semiology and structuralism and he chaired various faculty positions in France he traveled a lot he was he had a very a good reputation I guess we could say he traveled to the US he traveled to Asia um, he a lot of people know him by his essay the death of the author and um, 
he another interesting thing about him is that he lived with his mother basically his whole life barring when she passed away um, and he mentions that in a lover's discourse as well so I feel like a lover's discourse is somewhat autobiographical his last work is camera Lu- lucida which I'm probably not emphasizing that last word right lucida lucida um i'm definitely gonna get that one next and that is about the nature of photography and uh through the lens of a meditation on photographs of his mother um yeah so basically i guess i didn't really explain um, his interest in science. So he he really wanted to decode what he called a semiotic myth. So he felt that there were that signs and sig- the signified were able to create particular myths that were in control that so the bourgeois society was in control of that. Uh, so, for example, there's the portrayal of wine, which he says, you know, it's promoted as a healthy kind of habit, but that's a bourgeois ideal, and it doesn't actually align with reality that, you know, I guess, wine, I don't know, can, can be unhealthy. So he suggested that these semiotic myths were constructed in two levels. So the former pertains to the literal or explicit meaning of things, and then the latter is basically the language used to speak about the first order. And so he said that the bourgeois cultural myths that he wanted to decode were second order signs, connotations. Um, So there's, I guess there's a little bit of a a Marxist kind of slant to to Barth. Okay, so this, the third book that I picked up, so this is an author. So those first two were just authors that I'm currently reading and that I have read. And then I picked up another French uh, um, philosopher, Henri Bergson, just his key writings Bloomsbury has these beautiful, beautiful books. So partly because of the cover. Um, I really didn't know anything about Henri Louis Bergson, so I had to look up some information about him. It seems as if he is famous for four different books. And I'm assuming that there are selections from all of those books in this collection of writings that I have. Uh, so his four works are Time and Free Will, Matter and Memory, Creative Evolution, and the Two Sources of Morality and Religion. So let's try the French. Essai sur les données immédiates de la conscience. Matière et mémoire, l'évolution créatrice, les deux sources de la morale et de la religion. So there's, if you if you are into the French titles, <laughs> I just probably butchered them. You're welcome. So, uh, all right. So Henri Bergson is quite important. I was. I guess shocked that I didn't know this when I when I saw this that he won the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1927. He basically lived the life of a quiet French professor, and he married a cousin of Marcel Proust. He had a Jewish religious education, but lost his faith early on, and uh, it, it was it's said that his moral crisis came about because of the discovery of the theory of evolution, he 
was interested in reading Darwin. He kind of started off in science and math, so I think he's seen as kind of straddling the the both sides or the divide. I don't know how you say that. It's probably a horrible rhetoric um, of analytic and continental philosophy. He decided rather early on to focus on the humanities, but his interest in biology and psychology seemed to be always with him looking at what he he wrote. So academically, he was chair of Greek and Roman philosophy at first and then became chair of modern philosophy. He was friends with William James. He traveled around the U.S., doing lectures. Uh, he gave lectures in Scotland and kind of in connection with his interests in science and math. In the 20s, Albert Einstein actually critiqued Bergson saying that um, basically his knowledge of physics just was not great. And he, um, you know, he, it was like, poorly researched and making false claims. Merleau Ponty actually uh, defended Bergson and just basically told said that Einstein was failing to grasp the point. It was a philosophical discussion and not trying to be scientific. Um, I read that because Bergson emphasizes novelty, creativity, and freedom, that he is potentially considered a process theologian. He did critique a mechanistic understanding of causality. He wanted to emphasize the, the lack of predictability that can unfold concerning free will. And he was interested in the relationship between science and metaphysics. And it seems like he was really, he, he developed kind of ideas about intuition. Because intuition could perhaps be the path to knowledge of reality and maybe the absolute. And also I saw that there have been some comparisons of his work with Indian philosophies. So uh, so that is that. Now these next two books were inspired by encounters that I have had. The first is Owen Barfield, 1898 to 1999, British philosopher. I was briefly in a reading group on Rudolf Steiner with Matt Siegel and I think his name is Ashton. I don't know his last name. And uh, in the, I think I just went to one or two, or maybe just one, but the, the reading group, the discussion week that I went to, they mentioned Owen Barfield. So I remembered that, and I thought I would, I would pick him up. And so interesting. So I, I think one of the most interesting things about Owen Barfield is that he started out as a poet. He has a, a degree in literature and... He was, you know, a writer throughout his life and a visiting professor, but he was also a solicitor in London until the age of 60, which I think means that he was a lawyer or in law. He married a musician and a choreographer, which I think kind of shows his artistic, creative side. And he actually... I might need to check on this, but uh, it, just to just to confirm this is actually true. But I think that 
he is the reason that C.S. Lewis became a Christian. <laughs> so that is, I mean, that's wild. We, we wouldn't have C.S. Lewis's theological works if not for Owen Barfield. Is that, is that being too extreme? So um, basically they met, C.S. Lewis met Barfield when they were students at Oxford in, I think, like 1920 or 1919. And uh, they were in a group, like a literary group, with Tolkien and other people. And they had discussions about language and literature and myth, or, sorry, myth and metaphor. And... Uh, Barfield is also connected with anthroposophy. He attended a lecture, actually, by Rudolf Steiner in the 20s and just was basically reading and writing and translating Steiner all of his life. So the book that I picked up is Saving the Appearances, A Study in Idolatry, and it basically explores the development of human consciousness across history. So, uh, yeah, oh, and it says on the back of the book, C.S. Lewis called uh, Barfield the wisest and best of my unofficial teachers. So I think that's, that's so nice. All right, so the last book, the last book I picked up this author I picked up, actually a psychologist, which I think that psychology and philosophy just really overlap. When I was starting out my independent study, I think I mentioned I read a lot of Freud. So, and I have Jung on my bookshelves, and I have Eric Fromm and some others. I can't remember. So I double majored in English and psychology when I was an undergrad. I can't remember who I really, really liked. But anyway, um, I think someone who was interested in client-centered therapy. But yeah, I don't know. I can't remember. So James Hillman. So I picked up James Hillman's Alchemical Psychology, which combines all of James, Hill James Hillman's papers on the alchemical imagination from 1980 to the present. It says, well, I'll just, I'll just tell you about him as I as I know. Um, he's related to Jung. He studied, he actually moved to uh, where Jung was. He moved to Switzerland uh, where he met Jung and began to study his work and he actually got his PhD from the University of Zurich. But he was born in New Jersey in 1926. Basically, he, he was inspired by Jung, but he goes beyond him. He founded a movement concerning archetypal psychology. He was really interested, it seems, in the psyche or the soul. And he has, honestly, like such cool ideas. I think I'm really going to like this book. So basically what I found out about archetypal psychology is that it attempts to recognize fantasies and myths that shape and are shaped by our psychological lives. So the ego is one of many psychological fantasies. Basically he is critical of reductive psychologies that basically lack soul. He sees the soul at work in imagination and he's interested in fantasy and myth and metaphor and dreams. He even, and this was 
a super interesting thing that I found out that he even saw the soul in pathology. He said that pathology or neuroses is where the speech of the suffering soul, that sickness is a vital way, a vital part of the way that the soul becomes known to us. So we partly, so it, it's, it just reminds me of that quote that um, brokenness or wounds are where the light enters. So it seems as if it's not just when we're in a healthy state that we get close to our soul or higher self or eternal self or I don't exactly know how Hellman sees the soul, but it's also through sickness. Like everything is a teacher, I guess. So he calls his therapeutic process soul making and it has something to do with images to which people are drawn and understand in meaningful ways and so images and dreams kind of count for that but he had a particular way of understanding dreams he didn't necessarily think that dreams had sort of secret meanings in a sense it was more about staying with the image and describing the image and understanding that dreams he has a quote that I found that he says dreams tell us where we are not what to do so I thought that was interesting I don't know if I completely understand that but that's probably because I haven't read anything of his actually um I just looked up information about him so uh, Another idea that I really liked was the acorn theory, which means that, which, which says that people already, everyone already holds all the potential for all of their possibilities as a seed would. And uh, this potential is displayed throughout our lifetimes and actually manifested in its fullness perhaps or its highest best possibility when we actualize it in our calling and life work so I think it's interesting that there's an emphasis on the spiritual aspect of work and vocation and he also I guess talks about bad seeds (laughs) so I don't know uh, much about that But he says that it's the soul that's responsible for much of our character and our desires and our successes. And he seems to de-emphasize environment and parental um, causes, which is really interesting because I've been watching a few videos on the School of Life, Elaine de Baton, and he very much focuses on basically like parental flaws um the last uh, idea that i thought was really interesting of hillman was that he says that just as important as growing up is growing down is is also something we should look at so rooting in the earth becoming grounded so growing in like both directions so i would love to i don't know if this book has anything about that or many of these ideas but i would love to read about that so i'm really glad that i picked up helmet oh i didn't mention where i was inspired so i was asked to be on this podcast i think he just recently changed the name but it's a psychologist in Texas I think maybe near Houston and he has a podcast I think it used used to be called therapy for guys but now it's called psyche and I was on his podcast talking about Byung Chul Han and he just uh he didn't mention Hillman on his podcast but I follow him on Twitter now and 
he was quoting a lot from Hillman. So I thought, oh, that sounds interesting. I'll just add that to my next book haul. So those are my five books. I hope that you enjoyed. Um, hearing about the authors and the books, let me know in the comments if you have read any of these books or any of these authors. Um, like I said, I started reading The Birth of Tragedy, so that's the book from my book haul that I'm actually reading because I'm also, I just finished Han's Good Entertainment today and I'm reading a couple of spiritual books, Angela Di Foligno, this book on the New Thought Movement, I'm still kind of going through the Gnostic Bible and the first volume of the Zohar. And I'm reading a novel. I always try to add a novel in there in my current reading list. So I'm reading through the works of Annie or No. I don't know how many works I will read because I've realized that I like her books about relationships more than anything else. Right now I'm reading Exteriors. And, oh, like I said, I was reading, I'm reading Roland Barthes' A Lover's Discourse. So I think that's it. I'll probably, my next Han book is A Topology of Violence. So that's, that's the other one that I have. He has a book, I'm just reading basically all that is published of Byung Chul Han in English. There's a book called Absence, which is, Another, he wrote a book on Zen Buddhism, which I have and I've read, but his book that's coming out, I think in June, is called Absence. And so it's another book about Eastern philosophy. So I think I'll really like that one. And then the next Erno book I'll read is A Frozen Woman. And maybe the last one I'm going to read is the one that's coming out in September called. A young man. Um, is it like un fils jeune, maybe? Um, I don't know. I might have mixed genders <laughs> in that phrase. Um, but uh, yeah, so I'm really excited. I This is a Tuesday for me that I'm recording this in the second week of May. My grades are due at my college the, the class that I was taking as a student already ended, so made an A in that class. Super excited. That was a great class. I'm going to have to make a video on just all that we read and all that we talked about because that's one of the things that I wish, that I always wish that I would have done is uh, talk about my classes as I have been a student. I don't know why I didn't start a YouTube channel when I was in graduate school because that would have been so interesting, kind of just an interesting memory. I think that when you are a student in a class, even though you're spending a whole semester on a topic or a theme or a collection of works and you discuss them and you write papers about them, you'd think that it would be really easy but to talk about. But I think even now it's intimidating for me to think about making a video about that class because there's just so much. I'm probably going to have to take some notes and actually prep, but knowing me, we'll just, maybe we'll just see what happens. So, uh, oh, okay, so I was just um, saying that, yeah, so my grades are due for the classes that I'm teaching on Friday, so I am really going to have to start to wrap things up, and uh, this summer I just, I think I'm going to read a lot out on my balcony when the weather is finally nice. We've had, I live in Colorado, and the weather is not great. We have many, many months, six or seven months of snow. And it's, it's just, you know, it's obviously cold. <laughs> and so it's, it's very, it's just wintry. And the days, you know, are short as they are everywhere in winter. But then there is a month of wind like really, April is, is so windy. You can hardly go outside. 
other months are very windy too. Uh, and then May, the current month, is the month of storms. It's supposed to be April showers bring May flowers, but April is still winter, <laughs> I think, in Colorado. So May is the, it's May showers. And uh, I think it actually starts getting nice, is nice in June, July, August, and September, and then in October it snows again. So I don't think that I am, that this is my favorite weather, that I am perfectly suited for this weather. I think I might be better in Arizona let's say or I used to live in Southern California I really like the weather there but I don't know if I like the direction the state is going I'm just not sure not to get political but I'm just, just, maybe I've been hearing from the wrong people but Arizona I think would be a nice place I am just I would really love to live in a place where I can go outside all the time, where it's not windy, it's very calm, it's sunny, it's warm-ish or temperate. That's that's what I want. Send me to Spain, you know, or Italy or France or the south of France, somewhere like that. Okay, so thanks again for listening, and I will see you all in my next video.